Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to episode 476 of the Bible as Literature podcast. In the first chapters of Luke, just as the Spirit moves from womb to womb, beginning with the angel Gabriel, the commandment moves from person to person, ensuring that God's evdokia, his goodwill, is fulfilled in the spirit of the term to his complete satisfaction. From Zacharias and Elizabeth to Mary and Joseph, and notably the shepherds of Israel, the commandment and the spirit are the main actors in Luke, working overtime to ensure that the will of the Father is fulfilled in the story. As each roadblock falls, the temple, the priesthood, the seeking after signs, the ignorance of the Torah. There remains one final obstacle to the Father's objective, tribe and king. Along these lines, Herod stands out in the Lucan parade as one who does not receive the Spirit and openly rejects the commandment shunning the Lord's prophet and locking him in prison. Has the father been thwarted? With John out of the way, how can the command established in the beginning by the mouth of the angel Gabriel be carried forward? Herod the imposter. Herod the builder of buildings. Herod the trifler who thought he could steal the inheritance of the kingdom of the gospel from the Lord's Christ by sealing John the Baptist up in a cage. To borrow a beautiful title from a beautiful woman, I know why the caged bird sings. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you're listening to episode 476 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We have a saying on this program that we haven't used in a while. It doesn't matter how many fences or walls you build around your city or your country. There is nothing you can do to keep the gospel contained. It doesn't matter how hard you try. <laughs> you only get one chance to kill Jesus. If it doesn't work, you're out of tries. There is no second chance to kill Jesus Christ. And that is clearly demonstrated here in verse 21 of chapter 3 of the Gospel of Luke. Last week, we saw how Herod's family entanglements were in the end completely and totally corrupting. You cannot maintain your family ties and family loyalties, and also maintain your loyalty to the gospel, or in the case of the character of Herod, your loyalty to the law of Moses, which is carried by Jesus Christ to the nations in the story of the gospel of Luke. You can't do it. You can be loyal to the law of Moses and under its authority act correctly towards Herodias, but you cannot be loyal to Herodias and be loyal to the law of Moses. 
So in the end, Herod failed. And as a result, when faced with the Lord's prophet, the one who is the heir of the Lord's grace, of the Lord's instruction, the one who brings the Lord's judgment, when faced with that individual, what did Herod do? What any loyal family member would do. He shunned him. He locked him up in prison, which is similar to building a fence around your country or a wall around your city or executing Jesus and then trying to cover his tomb with a big stone and hoping that he'll never get out or locking the gospel up inside your building and hoping that it never gets out, which is the whole metaphor of locking the Torah up inside a temple of stone. Those of you who haven't heard the work that Richard and I did, for example, on the Gospel of Mark, we spent a lot of time explaining Mark's criticism of the temple of stone and the way in which Mark was criticizing Jerusalem for trying to seal Jesus up in a tomb of stone in the metaphor of the temple. The same thing is happening here in verse 20 when Herod sealed John the Baptist, the one who is bringing the instruction, when Herod sealed him up in prison. But all that is undone once again in verse 21. When we look at the way that this story unfolds, one of the things you notice is that this whole story about Herod and Herodias, if you took that story out, you realize that the story actually flows better. John is in the wilderness baptizing, and he baptizes a bunch of people. And while he's baptizing a bunch of people, this guy named Jesus come to be baptized. Okay? Perfectly normal kind of storyline. But the whole thing about Herod got angry and Herodias and he put him in prison and stuff. Anyway, back to the desert. It's a weird leap to the future and then jumping back. And, you know, this way that the narrative is jerking the reader from two points of view, it's awkward. And so whenever I see something awkward like this, it jumps out. So exactly what you said, Father, this family entanglement, you know, he would marry somebody against the law of Moses, you know, marrying your sister-in-law is forbidden. And John's like, hey, by the way, just letting you know that there's a judgment coming for all the people who break the law of Moses, just saying and this is the gospel, Herod's like, hey, let's make sure that this gospel doesn't get out because this is definitely not in my favor, so let's get this out of the way. Okay, so the reader knows that there's this danger to the one who is proclaiming the gospel, and that's what he's been doing in in verse 18, is declaring the gospel. So we know that John has left the city to go out to the desert, but we know that Caesar, through the hand of Herod, is trying to grasp him. The hearer of the text is feeling the tension. What's going to happen? Is that going to be the end of the gospel? And that's where we find ourselves right now when it comes to this next verse. The gospel's out there. People are being baptized. But we know that John's got a shelf life. We know he's not going to be out there forever. So what's the plan? Now... When all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. What is striking about this verse, you can hear it one of two ways, Richard. You can hear it as though, as you implied, Luke is taking us backwards and forwards in time. That is one way to hear the text. But it could also be that John the Baptist had pulled a fast one on Herod. Because when were all the people being baptized? It's just telling you, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was also baptized. Which means the work was accomplished. So it doesn't matter if you lock John up. The work was done. It's beautiful. You can strike me down. Now, I'm not saying anything positive or negative about Che Guevara. I'm not idolizing the man. But it reminds me of that saying about the character, about the legend that's built up around the character of Che Guevara. When they shot him, he said, you can kill me, you're just killing a man. It has that same flavor. Lock me up, you're just locking up John the Baptist. The guy whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, I already baptized him too late. 
that's the way it strikes my ears anyways, Rich. John doesn't care what happens because Jesus is on the move. Now, of course, we know that in the end, because we've already heard two other Gospels, it's at this point a done deal. We know how Luke ends. But we also know, as we say over and over again, we recycle this saying, in each Gospel, you only get one chance to kill Jesus. What then? What do you do when you kill Jesus, but people can still hear his teaching? How do you kill his teaching? Now, there are many people that are working very hard even now to kill his teaching. And the people who are most effective at it, as Paul points out in his own letter, are the Christians. I think the best people at killing the gospel in 2023 the best people at ensuring that God is mocked among the nations in 2023 are the Christians. But it doesn't matter because as long as the gospel is read, as long as the effort is made to explain these texts critically, and as long as people are willing to submit and obey honestly and intelligently the wisdom of the instruction of John the Baptist There is always hope. There is always hope. That is the hope of this teaching. So, as I said recently, don't be dumb. Just hear the text. Just hear the text. Father, I think this was so wonderful, the way that you explained this. It's saying, yes, John is being put into prison. But, oh, by the way, I already took care of that. Like, I love that the way that the story unfolds, because we mentioned last time that this story about John the Baptist and Herod comes way later in Matthew and Mark. So here, Luke made a very specific choice to put this here. I think it brings out this precise point, Father, that the story of John the Baptist and his entanglements with Herod show that the plan was always there for what was going to happen next. And this was already dealt with. When we have in this verse, all the people were being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And that's it. Jesus was baptized and prayed. I find it interesting that in Luke, we don't have all the drama about the sandal and I'm not worthy and are you really wanting to be baptized and how am I going to baptize you? None of that dialogue takes place here. He was just baptized. That's it, along with everybody else. In this... John baptizing all the people is also when he said, what are you doing here to be baptized? Who warned you of the wrath to come? What is the point of you being baptized? Either you have fruit worthy of repentance, which is actually better. So why would you come? Jesus nevertheless is baptized. Jesus is baptized because he's included in this people that is emerging from the Jordan River from the Red Sea, ready to move into the promised land. This is kind of the metaphor that we have picked up here, the literary image that we've seen before. And this is what Jesus is participating in here. But when he prays and the heavens open, it's much different than any of those other circumstances. And we find out then what is unique about Jesus in this section, why his baptism is not the same as everybody else's baptism. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. A couple of things jump out immediately. First, we have once again this lovely, lovely Greek term evdokeo, it's the evdokia, evdokisa in its form within the sentence. God is once again saying that he is happy, he is satisfied that things are unfolding the way he wants them to unfold. And he is, as a Roman patrician, putting Jesus on his knee and adopting him as his son. It is, in this sense, a classic scene in a Roman household. He is adopting Jesus through water and the Spirit as his son publicly. 
but he is doing so because the action of Jesus reflects the completion of his instruction. He is stating publicly, you are my son and I adopt you as such because the way you are acting reflects my will. I recognize you as my son because you're behaving as my son. That's one striking thing about the whole scene. The other thing, and I've not mentioned this in the past when we've come across the baptism of Jesus and other gospels, but the dove, which is obviously a symbol in the book of Jonah, is the symbol of peace. And when you transition so abruptly, Richard, from Herod, who is intrinsically a violent character in the broader story, I mean, he's a king, and de facto a king is a symbol of violence. But then you think of him locking John in prison here in Luke, and then you take a step back and think of how he behaves elsewhere in the New Testament, especially in Matthew. He's just a bundle of joy in the Gospel of Matthew. And then suddenly here in verse 22, you have Jesus essentially canceling Herod as the true heir of John's instruction, as the true heir of the throne of David. And in his adoption as son in God's household and his coronation as king on God's throne as the successor of David, the sign of his kingship is the symbol of peace. It's a beautiful, powerful image. Yeah, with all these images, you know, this is the Holy Spirit coming down on him bodily. That's what it says in Greek. Everything we've talked about, the Holy Spirit, and here it is, the Holy Spirit, before we talked about Holy Spirit. Here we have the Holy Spirit. So that Holy Spirit comes upon him, and everything with the, the Spirit that we've talked about already, it's animating force, leading you to do the correct thing. This is what is landing upon him. But it's also, as you said, Father, the coronation, the recognition from the heavens that this is the one. Now, one thing I want to make sure that everyone understands about sonship is Sonship is not principally about your child who you love. It's not principally about genetics. In the Roman Empire, it's a legal category. The son is the one who inherits. That's why a son can be a slave. A son does not have to be related to the father. And it's not a big deal to adopt. And in fact, legally, a father had to adopt any son. Why is that? a father has to make a positive declaration of who gets his stuff when he dies. Okay. There has to be an heir always. And therefore there has to be a public declaration somehow, at least a legal declaration of who is the son. So it's actually not a big deal that someone would be adopted, that someone would be declared a son. That's not a big deal. What's happening here is that the voice from the heavens is declaring that the heir is this Jesus. Jesus will inherit what belongs to the one in the heavens, which is his kingdom. We haven't had a lot of talk about kingdom in Luke like we had in Matthew, so much talk about the kingdom. We've had the law, but not as much about the kingdom, but now we have this inheritance before we had John who was preaching this gospel, but then what happens when John disappears? What happens is we have someone who is the declared heir of the voice from the heavens, and it's going to be his job, we know, to continue with this gospel, to declare this gospel, everything that John was already teaching. This is the one who inherits the heavens. Now, inheritance, when it comes to God, is always a tricky deal because usually, you know, like Paul says, inheritance doesn't mean anything until the person dies, right? God doesn't die. So what does that mean? It means that there is someone who is declared as the second in command, as the second who will be there in place of the owner of the land. So Jesus is declared as the one who is in charge of this teaching when the Father is not present. He is the heir. This is how Jesus, on the one hand, continues the gospel that John was preaching, that is eventually going to end when John is put into prison, but then also ramping it up 
a level because John was not the heir. He was just a plain old slave doing the will of the father. But this is the inheritor. That means he is the next after the father in charge of the kingdom. So he's not just someone who serves the gospel. He owns the gospel in a way below the father, below the king, but more than anybody else. So this ownership of the gospel, as well as what you said, Father, his obedience to the law of his father's house, because the father is still in effect, he doesn't disappear. Both are elements of what it means to be a son. It really makes the scheming of Herod, Herodias, and his brother all the more pitiful, all the more dismal. It makes the station of the Tetrarch all the more miserable in a way. So you're given responsibility for this fourth of a region split in four parts to do what? To do what? You are responsible to take what John the Baptist is bringing to you especially because you are supposedly sitting in the seat of David. And remember, Herod is the person who was, quote, the builder of the temple. You're supposed to take what John the Baptist is bringing to you and take it to the four corners of the earth. And you can't even take it to the four corners of your territory. Instead, you try to lock John up. And now the father himself, the father himself intercedes in the next verse and declares Jesus, the one whom John baptized, the true heir of the throne that you're sitting on, and you're sitting there squabbling with your sister-in-law. It's so petty. It's so embarrassing, but it's so typical of the human condition. That's why it makes one want to take a shower, Richard, because we're all covered in this filth. That's what's so powerful about the gospel. There isn't a listener who isn't familiar with how this kind of pettiness works in everyday life. This contrast of the drama of the court and the drama of the heavens is so stark. These two people who were related to the temple, related to the city, who have found themselves out here in the wilderness in order to ensure that the teaching continues as opposed to a guy who wants to get married to a particular woman because who knows what the reason, it's not even given. It's just plain old court intrigue. The contrast between earthly power and this desire to continue this gospel, which cannot be thwarted by human power. Prison itself can't hold in this teaching. As long as there is a dove that can fly, this teaching is going to continue and Jesus is going to continue it. And the beauty of Luke is it's followed up with acts. And even after Luke depicts the crucifixion of Jesus, then we learn about how the gospel continues. Even after that, in the book of acts, there is no way to stop the gospel. This is exactly how this book unfolds is by putting this story right here in between John's baptizing and evangelizing. We show that, with God's inheritance, there will always be an heir, and it's Jesus, and you can't lock him up. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father.
You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.